Hello and welcome, I'm Tara McGinnis, and I am delighted to be in conversation with this group of people today. Um, welcome to this event at New America. Um, we hope that whether you're watching live or you're um, repeating this at home, that you'll join in the conversation with us. Um, we're going to do this conversation really in three parts today. I want to introduce you to this truly amazing um, set of panelists. We're going to talk a little bit about the world um, and child welfare as it is and how we hope it can be. And then we really want to get in conversation with all of you, both here through the event, through Slido, um, and we'll, we'll pop our uh, Twitter addresses in there so you can keep this conversation going um, after we're done. First, I just want to introduce you to um, a few folks who I greatly admire. We are here today talking about a book that I wrote with Hannah Schenk called Power to the Public. Um, it's been described as a blueprint for governments and nonprofits to harness the power of digital technology to solve public problems. You're going to hear about what that looks like in one area today. And Hannah and I really wrote it to lift up the type of work um, that you'll hear, hear from our panelists. I want to just briefly introduce them. Um, some of you know them very well. We've got Marina Nitza, Sixto Cancel, and Amber Salzer. I'm so excited. Uh, Marina runs the child welfare vertical here at New America's New Practice Lab. It's a team I run focused on family economic security and well-being. Her portfolio includes an 18-state working group where child welfare leaders come together and share and co-design promising practices. Um, Marina is a public problem solver extraordinaire and was most recently the chief technology officer at the Department of Veterans Affairs in the Obama administration. Sixto Cancel, a founder and CEO of Think of Us, a tech nonprofit with a mission to drive systemic change in the child welfare and foster care system. Um, this is work that Sixto has been at since he was 16. He's one of the creators of Hack Foster Care. Um, this, is a, this is a movement that's brought a whole new set of diverse stakeholders into the conversation. And Amber Salzer, um, who um, is a program manager and LGBTQIA lead for the Department of Children, Youth, and Families. Um, in the licensing division. She's worked for the state of Washington really for a decade now, doing this mission critical work on child welfare, foster care, licensing and kinship. Um, her roles have involved working with children and families, supervision, continuous quality improvement. Um, prior to this, she worked in the private sector supporting homelessness and uh, supporting homeless and at risk youth and families. Ms. Salzer is driven to improve the quality of care for children, youth and young adults, and I can't wait to get in conversation with her today. So I think you have a sense of who we're talking to. I wanna begin um, with a round of, from all panelists, but maybe Amber, we'll start with you. I wanna just level set for our audience. How will you characterize the current state of the child welfare and foster care system in this country? And, and as we move through the panelists, maybe we can get into kind of the, some regional differences. Thanks, Tara. Um, I would characterize it as changing. I think it's changing and I think it's improving. And I think that sometimes it feels like it's not. I think if you ask the children, youth and families who are in this system, it feels like slow change, but I, I, I picture it like an avalanche where it's just building and building and building and, and we are in it now and it's changing for the better. You know, the way I look at it is like, I think it's a very exciting time, right? Because the ecosystem is just shifting. And so what I see right now in child welfare, there are pockets of really good things that are going on, that are innovating, that are starting to lead to results. But just as important as those pockets of work is that you see the money changing. So how things are financed. You see the regulations being changed because of the pandemic, right? And because there was a momentum pre-pandemic around changing some of these regulations. And then the laws that were changed over the last decade, a lot of those implementations like a Family First, the Normalcy as a Sex Trafficking and Normalcy Act in Child Welfare, um, Fostering Connections, like all of those are bubbling up to this tipping point of implementation and what needs to be iterated on some of those pieces and then what actually needs to be kind of scaled and started. And so we're in this very unique moment that it so happened that this specific sector went through some uh, reform changes that changed the way money and regulations went down with the pandemic hitting. And I think that is actually what's making it so ripe right now to actually think about what is the future that we actually want to create. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I love the optimism of my of my co uh, There's a lot uh, of pockets of goodness in foster care. So I work with 18 states. I, I interact with a number of other ones. And 
you know, some are doing really amazingly. They're licensing 99% of kin. They're making sure that kinship placements are financially resourced. Some are knocking it out of the park in terms of making sure that kids are placed with adults that they know and trust from the first day that they're in foster care. And some are knocking it out of the park in terms of keeping kids out of foster care, which is a goal that I think has been um, under-recognized for a long time and is getting a lot more attention and resources now. And I'm excited to see that. So I wanted to talk because it's been a it's been a real eighteen months. Um, I want to talk a little bit about COVID nineteen, some of the successes of your work, and some of the efforts on on really tackling group homes. Absolutely, uh, we want us to kick it off. So um, you know we ran this uh, qualitative study. Um, because as foundations, like the Annie Casey Foundation was going through a process where they were thinking through what is their next step, right? And um, in terms of reducing, making the decision to eliminate or reduce care. And in their strategy making, they realized that there was all this science around what's going on um, and what are the harms of institutional placements. But what was missing from the body of work was what were the actual things that young people were experiencing and were saying and were believing about group homes? And so we went on that journey and we um, engaged 78 participants. We were able to really lift up those uh, experiences that young people went through and it wasn't at, it wasn't too positive. And so it matched up with some of the harms that we knew um, were happening from like the numbers perspective, but to put the narrative to it, we heard young people talk about, you know, how the restrictive setting of not being able to have access to the right hair products or the right hygiene products, the routine of every day having paid people giving you cafeteria food when what you want most is a home, right? The ability to, um, the experiences of having your visitation leveraged as if you behave, then we'll give you visitation. But that actually doesn't actually lean, it doesn't bring you any closer to healing. And so we heard from young people, their experiences and um, shared those with actual state leaders. And as of today, we have 22 states who have raised their hand to say that they are going to either eliminate or um, re dramatically reduce the use of group homes in their states, and specifically the use of uh, the use of group homes as a placement. Um, there are young people who have severe, um, you know, psych psychological needs, and so that's a very different type of uh, group home than the ones that we're talking about today. I'm really glad that you brought both the incredible outcomes to bear, the commitment that states have made, but also the method behind it, Sixto. And I think this is something in the new practice lab, but really in the conversation of power to the public that we're trying to elevate, that um, it isn't always about the what, it's about the how. And I think this formula you followed in the case study and we can share it out um, to, the, to the broader group um, that think of us uh, work on group homes really elevates the importance of bringing the, to bear the voices of the folks who are at the center of this policy, um, by and large part, these young people. And so this method, while it seems plain as day that you would start with the people at the center of the challenge who are being served and ask them how it's going is not generally how we make policy. Um, um, and certainly, you know, maybe a survey or here or there, but really to anchor into the folks you serve. And so. Uh, I'd be really interested um, to lift up this method. This is one of three things and to show that it isn't an outlier set of group, but to do this paired with data in real time and say, this is the, you know, this, this isn't just 78 people. This is the experience um, that you can see in other data points across the board, I think is part of the power um, of getting the state commitments that you do. I just want to open up and see if anyone else is interested in talking about the importance of really anchoring into um, the families you serve or, or things you've learned along the process from them. I just want to say I shared the two links to um, six shows, the qualitative studies. They're uh, hard reads, but I think everybody needs to read them to really understand what these young people's experiences can be. I'll just add that I think it's like so crucial that we are working with the people that we're serving and that we're listening to them and like that we are culturally responsive and elevating the children, youth, and families because they're the ones that know best. We don't come into the work as the experts. We're not. We are to meet with them and let them guide the work with us too. It's really important. And I think as we see in child welfare system and, and many other government systems, sometimes the, um, the 
structural bias gets baked in deep and presents itself, whether it's hair products or other ways. And I'd love to just, especially as we level set before we talk about building what we'd like, um, ask each of you, maybe um, starting with Marina, you know, where do you see um, the inequity that we're tackling as a country really show up in pronounced ways? And what are some examples? Absolutely. I mean, you can look at child welfare as a whole and see that we are crazily disadvantaging and harming our black and brown families. But then when you start looking into why, um, it's easy and a key reason why we all need to do what Sixer did, which is go out and work with the families and put the children and the families at the center is that you're in my experience may be very different from the other, the experience of the families that we are interacting with. And if you don't understand their experience, you build in structural harms without realizing it. And I think those are a tremendous opportunity in child welfare. Um, as a few examples, you know, when you're approving a grandmother or an aunt or an uncle to take placement of a child, we have a lot of hoops that you have to jump through. And well-meaning people added requirements, like you have to have functional literacy, which they meant to say you need to be able to read a medication label. But in practice, that gets held against people that have limited English proficiency and became almost a literal literacy test. Um, that's harmful. And, and my working group is helping to remove that requirement from states. Um, thinking that folks should have recycling, that's nifty, but is actively harmful that you would require a kinship placement to have recycling in order to get financial placement. Um, things about community standards, which were intended to say, hey, if you live in a community where every house has lead paint, uh, we're not going to ding you for having lead paint. That was turned on its head and used as a racist and classist way of denying a lot of families uh, licensure by saying your home isn't up to community standards as it is up to me. And even just imagining how easy a particular task is. Um, I'm going to cite tuberculosis tests, which many states require for all their kinship placements. Um, taking I, it may be pretty easy for me to go get a tuberculosis test, but taking time off work, finding childcare, finding transportation, going to a medical facility which requires waiting, potentially being exposed to COVID and paying some amount of fee is an insurmountable hurdle that uh, I think as Amber, you and I realized in Washington state, even if you test positive for tuberculosis, that's actually not a denial. So why are we putting so many people through this burden and tremendous props to the state of Washington for actually uh, removing that requirement and changing it so that you only have to do it if you um, answer a particular way to some screening questions that mean you really may be at risk for it. And I think looking for those sorts of ways that we've really baked um, harm into the system without realizing it is a key to fixing a lot of it. So Amber, either of you want to jump in with stories from your work or other examples about how this inequity shows up? I will just add that inequity shows up for us like as a nation because of disproportionality. There's the disproportionality of children in care where there's there are overrepresented black and brown children, indigenous children. There's it's it's not that that's one piece of it. And then there's also the challenge that caregivers don't represent the community or the folks who are receiving services from the system. So there there's this awareness of what the problem is, but now like we're building on it. Like in Washington state, we have a new unit recruitment and retention. So there's targeted recruitment specialists who are gonna be reaching out to those communities. We're aware of where the childcare deserts, deserts are, who are trying to bridge these kinship resources into our system because that's what's best for kids. But that's, you know, it's been, inequ it's, it's been inequitable over time. And I think that like Marina, you mentioned it's these, good intentions, right? The history of social work is this idea of happy helpers coming in to help families. When we look back, like we know there has been so much harm that's, that's, that we've caused, you know? And so it is like, like you said, Marina, we're turning it on its head. We're trying to make some change for the better. Yeah. When I think about like the inequities that we face every single day, I mean, the, one of the inequities here that we see at Think of Us is even the battle of young people versus families. Um, when we were looking during the pandemic um, to kind of unblock um, these housing vouchers that were made specifically for young people um, who have experienced foster care, in many places uh, we could do that. But in some places, if there was another program um, called a FUP, then they were like, you can't launch the foster care specific housing program. You have to work through that program. So we put workers and in, in frontline workers in a position where they had to make choices around, do I give this young person of a housing voucher or do I give this 
family of five about a housing voucher. And in it, it's that competing, it's that pivoting towards each other that we see over and over in child welfare when it comes down to older youth in care. There's a narrative of like, oh, well, if we can go earlier before young people are teenagers, then we can go ahead and have different type of interventions in their life when that is actually not supported by the actual science, right? Um, we know that young people um, who are in their adolescent stage have, um, this, we used to believe from zero to six, you had the most flexibility in your brain. Uh, the Promise of Adolescence is a great report to look at by NAM. And we used to believe like that was your moment. And if you can get, if you if we can do interventions there, then it would set a different trajectory for a young person's life. And that's true. But what's also true now, and what we've learned post 2011, is that yeah, adolescents actually have a, the same plasticity kind of upswing during their adolescent years, and that that's an opportunity to rewire the brain. That's an opportunity to really develop those skills. And so one of the biggest inequities that I see for the young people that we serve is just even the perception that is uh, and, and the mental models that are leading policy and leading practice that actually doesn't actually help young people heal, develop, or really even positions them to thrive. And then I would be remiss if I didn't mention that, according, you know, the Public Health Journal published just one stat that I just want people to just totally meditate on when you get a chance, which is 53% of all Black families will experience a child abuse investigation before their child's 18. 53%. So if they're if, like, if I don't, if that's not a black issue, I don't know what is a, a people of color issue, right? And so I say that to say there's something systematic that has been created years and decades ago that it's now our opportunity to dig into and say, how might we actually unravel some of those inequities um, is, in, in things like Marina had just said. I appreciate you stopping us. And I'm just gonna, for the point of it, maybe we can make sure this, the fact and the link um, um, make it out to the entire audience, but that 53% of all Black families would experience a child abuse investigation. Um, back to the, the nature of how, how scaled and um, sunk in uh, a culture of, of deeply, you know, investigating some families. And our, our moment really um, to dig in on that, it does feel like now and how that shows up. I do think um, we talk in the in the book a bit about a phenomenon in some child welfare systems of just like whose data, whose data the government has and whose data the government doesn't have. And so I think some things that often appear um, kind of an agnostic and neutral, we talked about the importance of anchoring into the human conversation, but a big piece we work on elevating is data, real-time data practices. But so often um, low-income and black and brown communities their, you know, substance abuse shows up in government data where what their wealthier white counterparts has the same challenges, but not in a, in a government data set that would lead you to, to the type of um, a child, child abuse investigation. So I think really thinking um, how we curate data, who is involved in, in using and analyzing data and do people come from the communities um, uh, that, that, that lie in the data is going to be a really important part as we move forward, especially as more and more government systems kind of rely on a bunch of data feedback loops. I want to shift now. So we've level said, um, this is a truly optimistic group that's already gotten into where we're going from where we're coming from. Um, maybe Amber, I'll, I'll start with you, but I'd love to just get each of you in your own words to, to lay out a vision of what you see as possible and either at kind of at a mission level or at a specific example level um, in the child welfare system. You know, let's paint a picture of where we could head. Thanks, Tara. Um, I think like as a mission level, one of the things that we have identified in Washington state is that race is not a predictor of your outcome. So like you, like there's this idea of preschool like to prison pipeline and like that that is not like we we want to get all the way away from that so race should not be an indicator of your success in this world as a child youth or adult um I think specifically like one of the visions I have with in child welfare is this idea that um that everyone is welcome like in foster care licensing these myths that I think are myths that still exist like when you have a, a same-sex couple who think that they can't even apply to provide foster care to children or adopt children, that is not okay. And we are changing that. And that's like, it's incredible to be a part of that. So 
brief examples. <laughs> You know, I'll talk at the 100,000 foot level. For me, when I think about what is the new vision going forward, you know, I think there's a lot of conversation about prevention and the laws and the money have changed in order to be able to do more in that space. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to do the right things as an ecosystem, right? And that we'll design with the actual people who are impacted. Um, so my hope is that on the prevention end, that you know, the, the folks who need it the most are the ones who actually find themselves in child welfare. But when we don't need young people to come into care, that we have provided that support. But I'm also hoping that this specific moment is actually leveraged to say, what does, what type of support and, 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 and aid actually can be leveraged at that moment for those families? Then once you're in care, that we have a new system that is truly rooted in family first, right? And so including family in all different aspects, being placed with relatives, and even when that's not possible, that even if you find yourself in a foster home, um, when you don't know someone, that the conditions are set up for you to be able to heal, for you to be able to develop, and that you truly, at the end of that experience, are positioned to thrive just as much as your pairs are. Thanks, Deb. Absolutely. I just, I agree with that wholeheartedly. I think that that's beautifully said. I don't know how I top that. Everything that they said, um, when people ask me what my goals are in child welfare, I usually have a three-part answer, which is one, most kids shouldn't be in foster care in the first place. We regularly remove children because a parent couldn't afford daycare, left them home alone, and they were reported for leaving them home alone. Then we cause intergenerational trauma, hundreds of thousands of dollars of fees, and then we go turn around and we pay the foster parents a daycare stipend. Just pay for daycare up front. And then we avoided the removal and the tremendous harm. Um, so we should be keeping most kids out of foster care in the first place. Uh, second to that, if a child really has to enter foster care, they should be placed with an adult that they already know and trust. And that adult should be immediately financially resourced to keep that child through to permanency, whether that means the child stays with them or ideally they go home. Right now here in your comments, and I can see in the head nodding from the panel, um, and Amber, you've mentioned that a system that's proactive versus reactive. Six so you said this in the kind of front. Let's really focus in on the support rather than the system that we have today. Um, I can't help but make sure, and maybe we can pop into the chat. The New York Times did an incredible investigation today on the cost of, of, of the child care that would leave you to be a parent who leaves a kid at home. And we are dead last in our national peers. There are, I think, 500... <laughs> At five hundred dollars compared to five x what any of our peers are spending, and it would break your heart that um, perhaps saving, paying for someone to be in a home um, by by investing in the childcare, and hopefully we're on the bridge of that here um, with a very active conversation in Congress about making these front end investments through a child tax credit through um, lowering the cost of childcare, um, through really investing in families on the front end to be able to stay in there homes or um, have have high quality care for their the children and youth. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to join you all in the glass half full here. I want to um, first remind everyone that we would love to be in conversation with you. I can see some co questions coming into the chat in Slido already. But let me just pause because um, just in a few moments, we're going to turn this over to a, a larger conversation. So please take a moment now, put your question in the um, in the Slido chat. Um, we are here to, you can hear the energy from the panelists, we're here to get in conversation, not just with um, this, pa this panel, but with all of you. Although, if you don't, I have a lot more questions of my own. <laughs> so I want to keep moving and maybe, Amber, grounding into your work in Washington State, I want to ask you a kind of a two-parter to start. First, um, you've made a lot of change at a, at a public sector level. I'd like you to talk about as specifically as possible one of Washington State's successes. Um, and I know part of that is helping colleagues recognize and embrace change. So, um, you know, the steps on that, if you would jump in first. Okay, thank you. Um, I say that one of the successes that I uh, I'm super excited and happy for Washington is how we are, um, we are putting, um, okay, so let me speak to this. So like specifically in Washington, we, we have an office of racial equity and social justice. That office has identified LGBTQIA plus leads 
for our division. In licensing division, we were allowed to identify leads region-wide. So we have leads who are volunteering their time in addition to their workload to focus on how we can be inclusive to that specific population within foster care licensing. So those leads are responsible for teaming with their peers and training and elevating how we are an inclusive agency. From that, we're also shifting how we ask questions. So there's a reason that people feel like they cannot come and apply for licensing. Um, and so we're asking questions in a different way. It's not, would you support a child who may or does identify as LGBTQIA+, it's how will you support that child? We're also changing like how we ask those questions this expectation we have is that families do help keep families together, reunite families. So when we're working with foster families, people who want to provide care to children they don't know, we're asking them, how will they maintain connections with the child's family? How will they support permanency, not just legal permanency, but cultural permanency and relational permanency? So how we are asking questions and meeting with families looks different and it lines out the expectation early on when we're working with them. So that's that's a pretty specific change and it's big. Like historically it's been, our system is, you know, it's it's binary and our laws, the precedence things are, you know, there's there's a lot there. So that um, it is changing. How to get people to embrace change, you know, I think it looks like a lot of ways for different people. So I think it's, um, it's you know, personal stories. It's really listening and centering the experience of the people who are working with our system. It's data, it's research, um, and it's changing this rhetoric that like change is hard to um, stability is change. Like change is the only thing that's going to keep happening. Right. So do you want to jump in a bit on, on how you really get the breadth of nonprofits to anchor into the voices um, and organizing of young people and people who are in the foster care system? Yeah, absolutely. One of the things I'll say is that, um, you know, one, I had the pleasure to learn from Marina and folks like Emily Wright Moore, um, different tactics to try to understand the problem differently. And I think when we've been doing this work for so long, that the number one thing that I do think is missing, one of the things that I think is missing is to be able to step back and start to understand your problem differently. And that's by centering lived experience, but being intentional about not just being um, centering lived experience you have access to, but actually being inclusive of the spectrum of experiences. And that will start to broaden your horizon around what are some of these problems? So the first thing I would tell folks is like, which does not, which causes staff time, um, which is to understand the problem differently by engaging lived experience. And then from there, being able to say, okay, how might we then um, be able to organize around these different themes when you're able to pull out like our report that has multiple quotes from multiple perspectives of people who are directly impacted, people who work on the issue. You, the organizing comes together, right? The unison starts to come together because folks start to understand the issue differently and start to understand the possible solutions differently. Um, and so what I would encourage is like, if you want to organize really well, the first part is to listen extremely well. And that listening is going to bubble up those insights. If you want to organize really well, the key is to listen really well. I think that's some keeper uh, comments for whatever area you're working, be it um, with children. Marina, um, I know you as a person of um, ruthless focus on outcome, in addition to being someone who's volunteered in the system. And so I'd, I'd love for you just to talk a little bit about how you take a, take a problem at its source, at the center that seems unbearable and kind of break it, break it down. Yeah, my specialty as it were. Uh, but I think the secret is, is not a secret at all. It's the only way I know how to do this is to work backward and really crawl through what the process is directly. And to Sixto's point, like do it with as many people with real experience uh, as possible. So like um, if we take ending group homes, which I am a huge supporter of, that sounds like a really overwhelming goal. Um, or if you tell people, you know, there's 100,000 kids in foster care that need homes, that's like people get paralyzed. They don't know how to help 100,000 people. And so you really need to break it down and work backward. And like, to me, it's like, how do kids end up in group homes in the first place? And you start working with real kids and you work backward and you read their files 
And I mean, Sixto, you have a, a crushingly emotional New York Times op-ed from a couple weeks ago that everybody should read, which is that you had an aunt who was not just available, but was a foster parent and the system didn't find her. That is criminal and unacceptable. And it happens all the time. Most states, the way that they find family for kids in foster care is they check the credit bureaus. And if you guys have ever looked at your own credit report, it says like, you know, Marina Nitza may be associated to, you know, my husband, Charles and other people. And they send letters in the mail, form letters to the people that are associated with you on your credit report. And that's it. That's how they do family finding. Um, and, you know, I give a ton of credit to a state like New Mexico at the beginning of 2020, their kinship placement rate was around 3%. And they have gotten it to almost 60% during a pandemic by doing some pretty basic things like shifting the incentive so that you have to ask kids about placement options. Um, and I think like to me, a huge way to do this is you break family finding and relative finding down so that you make that the easiest step in the system. When a kid enters care, you have to make the easiest path to finding a relative and placing them with that relative. And then you need to make the easiest path licensing, which means financially supporting that relative. And if you do that up front, the number of kids that are going to trickle down and move 65 times and change high school 16 times and end up in a group home or in juvenile hall, to me, fundamentally gets much, much smaller. So to recap, I would immerse yourself with people with lived experience and also like really crawl through the process because the secrets are all in the or the solutions, I should say, are all in the details. It's in the removing the recycling requirement. It's in understanding that functional literacy is not a literacy test. It's in that sort of pieces. And slowly but surely move, elim eliminating them. I want to come back because um, I know there's some interest in the group about re removing the recycling requirement and other things like that. But before we jump into conversation again, pop your um, questions into Slido, friends. Marina, I just want to close out because I know you are working with Amber and a number of others um, in a kind of shared way, a way that breaks them, I think, the norm. And can you tell us a little bit about your working group and how you share these practices out um, when someone has figured out a hack that it that which is probably the wrong thing to call it. These are um, these are fixes that help um, you know millions of families. You want to talk about the working group a bit? Yeah, absolutely. So I um, at under Tara, Tara is my boss at New America. So I run an 18 state working group. Uh, every month we have a different topic and they tend to be pretty specific. It's background checks for foster parents. It's how do you find relatives? And then I meet one-on-one -on -one with each of the 18 states and learn about their process in a super non-judgmental, very friendly way. And what ends up happening every month is that somebody has a problem that someone else has already solved. And it really mixes up who may be the problem solver versus who may have the challenge on any given month. And then we kind of capture what the promising practices are and we publish them on our website, which you can go to at childwelfareplaybook.com. And they, states uh, love to go second. Uh, people are afraid of being first. It's scary, it's risky, but they love to go second. And so anytime I can find a state that went first, they have a great definition of a relative. They have a great form for family finding. They have a great set of questions for their placement desk. We capture that and share it back out with other 17. Um, and so I found that to be a really effective way of like building genuine relationships with the decision makers and the leaders on the ground, but also being useful because, you know, we've done user research on this. And when a state wants to know what other states are doing on a particular topic, 100% of our uh, user research participants said that they Google it. And that's a real slow way to figure out what 52 other systems are doing. And uh, a, the new solution is email Marina. And then soon uh, next year, we're going to be launching some dashboards on the website, which will actually let you see in real time, like, hey, what other states have tuberculosis test requirements. I thought everybody had that. Oh, I'm one of three states. That's a really interesting peer pressure to stop doing a thing that everybody thinks that everybody else is doing. Uh, I will have to say, I, I am like so full support of this model. When the pandemic hit and um, every, like child welfare is like 90% in person function, right? Pre-pandemic. And so you have to walk to the courthouse. You got to get paperwork signed. You got to go find, call the foster parents, move a person in. And so there was a lot of like, we don't know what to do when people went into shelter in place. And we took exactly Marina's model from learning it from her and being able to say, hey, how do we stand up a whole command center where we publish over 30 different playbooks of doing the same exact thing? Well, people are like, we can't recruit foster parents because it's a pandemic. And then we were like, Marina. And Marina was like, well, they're in this one state, they already have grandma on the phone and send PowerPoint 
um, paper slide decks for the orientation and training. There's already, um, you know, New Mexico who was doing some virtual stuff. There was Washington State who had uh, online um, courses. And so all together, you actually get the entire uh, spectrum that was needed in one week. So in one week, this national problem of we have to halt our recruitment for foster parent actually was debunked. And we actually saw that um, people were not like one, one software company called Venti um, was doing these applications. We had 20, in, in one month, they had 2,500 applications, 70% of which attended their orientation within 30 days because now it was all online. And so this whole model of being able to pick something very specific, very practical, um, have people learn from each other was instrumental for child welfare getting through the pandemic. I want to move us in, unless um, other panelists want to jump in. I'd love to move us to some questions from the audience and please um, do anchor yours in. Turns out that sharing what works, works. And I think um, if anyone here wants to get in on these sharing circles of uh, debunking myths, uh, I, I suspect we have three, at least three eager partners and teams behind them. I want to get to the, um, to one of the first questions, which really gets at kind of scarcity mindset. The questioner, um, Sid Gardner says, child welfare lacks resources to achieve its mission at both its front and back end. Um, you know, how will other agencies' resources be secured to support those missions? And I'd love to open that up to anyone who um, wants to, uh, would like to jump in, hop off mic. Is this a resource question? Yeah, go for it. I can help. Uh, so one thing that I, I really see here is there's a lot of problems that individual child welfare systems do not have the resources to do, but that everybody has the literal same problem. So like one project that my working group is working on right now is data-driven foster parent recruitment for kids that don't have kinship placements. And you might think that is a, just like talking to actual kids. You might think like, of course you should use data to recruit foster parents, but running that data analysis and then acting on it and having a multi-year data-driven plan is more resources than any individual child welfare system has, but they all have that same exact problem. And so what we are doing, we have a, a team of amazing, amazing data scientists at the uh, uh, Radical Innovation for Social Change uh, team at the University of Chicago. And they, we are working with five states. We're doing the data analysis to show like, what's the gap? What kind of families do our kids need the most? When they're entering care, what school do they go to? What language do they speak? so that we can recruit families that match the needs of those kids, assuming they have no kinship placements available. Um, and we can then make that model available to every state so they always have a real time to-do list. And we can collect data like, let's say I need a Vietnamese speaking family that could take a six-year-old boy in a um, high, high population city. How long on average does it take to recruit a family like that? 22 months, 24 months? That's the sort of data that we can easily start pulling together nationally, but is very difficult for individual child welfare systems to figure out, especially some states have county administered systems. So it's not like the state of California, for example, it's 58 different systems inside California and individually, you know, San Francisco may have a lot of money, but a lot of smaller counties may not have the resources. And so I think really that's where I'm excited is to say, what can we do collaboratively together that we could then share back out with the rest of child welfare to, to so the rising tide lifts all boats. You know, one of the things I'll add is that there are other buckets of money that I wonder how creative we can get. For example, the American Recovery Plan provided states with 350 million, excuse me, $350 billion, right? And as we were thinking through what can help the 20,000 young people who just aged out on October 1st, because the moratorium expired, um, this bucket of money might have a solution. And so current interpretations fit all of those who have aged out and the lack of supports that they have. So child welfare agencies can pull down some of that $350 billion that some of it has not yet been used. They'll have to advocate for it, but there is a potential there. But I think one of the challenges that we have sometimes, if it doesn't say foster care, if it doesn't say kinship care, that sometimes we might overlook it. Um, uh, uh, and so how might we start thinking about, you know, those in foster care, those connected in our field as regular American citizens who we can leverage some of these other bigger buckets of dollars to be able to go ahead and create interventions. I want to ask um, the panelists and anyone jump in. One of the questions is what, what are your thoughts about how 
the child welfare workforce impacts our ability to implement solutions. Maybe Amber, you would start this one off. How the child welfare workforce impacts our ability to implement solutions. Well, I think that um, the child welfare workforce is really big and there's all different humans who show up to do this work. I know when I started social work, there's a lot of jokes about like, there's a reason you're in social work. And I'm like, yeah, that's true. We're not talking about it. But I think that like how we can impact the work is because we all bring our human selves into the work. This is human services. And so I think in some ways, you're going to have someone who's going to go above and beyond and do amazing. And then you're going to have someone who's just not in it or in it for a reason that maybe isn't going to benefit families and could potentially impact harm. So I think how our workforce impacts them is different and it can be positive and negative, but it's not one way or the other. It's a whole spectrum. And I think that, you know, there's, um, there's work to be done. Like doing this work and doing it well means that you're on the journey and you're doing the work yourself too. And so I think if you find yourself in chill out well for doing the work, there probably is a reason that you're doing the work. And it means that you keep doing the work. And when you're tired, you take a break. And when you need to quit, you quit. Um, you know, maybe that's every day. Maybe you're quitting every night, right? But you're showing up and still doing the work. So does it impact it? Yes. Specifically how, you know, I don't know. I look around my office. Well, my office is my home now. But at work, I would look around when I worked in CPS, there are certain people I would not feel good about showing up at my doorstep. And there are certain people where I'd be like, come on in, look at, look at this beautiful mess, you know? So I think, yeah, yeah, it impacts it. And that, that probably isn't the most straightforward answer, but um, how? Good and bad, everything in between. Sorry. I appreciate it. And um, I want to, if anyone else wants to hop in on this, the workers in the, in the system jump in. I do think it's something we observe in other stories. I think um, Sixers Work pulls out interviewing the families we found in other um, areas of public service, really asking the frontline workers for things that um, they see that are barriers and blockers for families. Like, I think, as you said, Amber, very few people um, get into this to be um, rich and famous, and sometimes the learning lives with the, some of the frontline staff. So would anyone else like to comment on this work, workforce question? Uh, yeah, I used to, this came up a ton at the VA and other governments too, where a lot of people think there's like an evil dude on the 11th floor that's like designing evil foster care and denying veterans their benefits. And I kind of say to them, like, that'd be great if there was an evil guy on the 11th floor, because I just like put a chair under his door, I can't get out, and then I can fix it. But a lot of it is because it wasn't designed at all. Um, and I think when you think about the workforce, just as you have to center the families and the children, you also have to really spend time with that workforce. CPS workers are really concerned with children not dying and not being abused. And they are afraid, very afraid, and they, you know, rightfully so, of accidentally missing something. And that's where all their incentives and their framework is, is aligned. And you have to recognize that when you want change like prevention work. You have to give them safety and guardrails and, and structure for changing that. Because otherwise, if your goal is to prevent abuse and prevent um, child death, it's hard to then also uh, give slack on maybe a gray area or an area that there isn't clear guidance on. And I think there's a lot of work and support that could be provided there. I echo that. I was going to say, I almost felt like this was a trap question because the problem is not on the actual workers is and, and, and there's problematic behaviors for sure, but it's the, it's the conditions in which we ask people to work within. Right. And the, and what drove the creation of our system, you know, in, in the colonies times we took from Britain at that point, when we were working with people, foster care is a lot of poverty issues. 74% of the cases are neglect. When we when we adopted those mental models from Britain, there literally were laws in the books in 1601 that said there is the worthy poor and there is the unworthy poor. And so we have we have a, a culture already in America about who has earned the right for case management support based on how compliant and how willing they are to follow what you're saying, right? These are systemic issues, conditions that we have put people in that is going to force their behavior to act in a certain way. Um, I think this is like a really rich conversation. And I know our questioner um, did note that in the state they work, they're suffering from a lack 
from really hundreds of vacant positions. So um, what used to have been a team of many is a team of few. And how do you really t- uh, engage families and children when you don't have enough workers, which I, I'm going to guess is a, a case in many places through the combination of the pandemic and retirements. I want to move us on to um, uh, a question that I think is going to excite this group. We would like to learn more about these requirements like recycling. How do they get put in there in the first place? And how can we find other ones <laughs> like this? Um, uh, Marina, would you like to start? Yeah. Um, I think the best technique there, not only you have to crawl through the real process, because like if you interview someone broadly and ask like, what are the burdens in foster care? You're not going to find the same things as you would if you actually tried to become a licensed foster parent yourself, for example, or you sat on other people being licensed. Um, but you also got to ask the five whys, which is a technique where you say like, why? And then they give you an answer. And then you ask why five times in a row, try to get to the root source. Um, recycling came from an explanatory paragraph in something called the Model Foster Home Licensing Standards that was attached to the Family First Act. And what happened was a few well-meaning states copied and pasted the guidance instead of sort of like rewriting and implementing it. And that's how you end up with um, requiring a cycling. And then it's not until you talk to some families on tribal reservations who say like, hey, we don't have recycling in the traditional sense. And you you didn't let me get licensed as a result of that, that you're like, oh, whoa, oops, nobody meant to do that. And there's unfortunately sort of like probably a hundred different ways that a requirement can end in a lawsuit, a, a water cooler rule, a, a thing, you know, a whooping cough pandemic in 1980 that nobody ever revised the rules for. So asking the whys I think is really critically important. And then something I, I pretty openly do with my working group is let's say I find like a thing like recycling and nobody's quite willing to undo it. I find like which of my 18 chess pieces is maybe most willing to undo it or most well poised to remove it. And then once you get one, you can start using the positive peer pressure to say, hey, you know, uh, California has a medical report that you fill out yourself instead of requiring you to the doctor. Like let's use that to help other states remove that, that really big barrier and rethink it. I'm gonna jump just- to, oh, go ahead, Amber. Oh, no, I just wanted to add to what Marina was saying, because I think that that like the family first, it's like, like everything else, really good intentions. But then when you break it down and ask those whys and consider equity in those whys, you, you realize there's a lot we can change because it might be, might be really easy for some one person to go get a TB test and one person to go get a divorce decree and one person to go get their vaccination records for their kids and their rabies, their dogs. But then you add all of those things together and now you have 80 things that are enormous. Do you think um, this is a common theme in child welfare, but for folks who are working in other um, public systems, this is true across the board that uh, something well intended in an era where the internet wasn't invented or something well intended, um, it's a little for for musical theater fans like Fiddler on the Roof, you know, why do we do this? I don't know, but it's a tradition. And then you can kind of ask people like, well, could you find it? find the law where we started this tradition or the regulation and it doesn't always make sense but even just doing that exercise is something that um as many of our audience folks have pointed out in a thin you know with a workforce that's already stretched stretched thin you're taking on an extra project to uh, and the man to try to figure out why why this um you know clause got in there and to take the effort to get it out and so i think creativity here, but this is a common uh, pain point across government benefit delivery and um, really shows up for families in the burden of time in a way that I think um, we wouldn't put uh, put on uh, other communities across the country. I want to get, we're coming close to time. I have a few more questions. I want to ask, kind of digging in on the perspectives of families. Questioner says, with in communities with lots of poverty and trauma and very few uh, resources and support, some kids end up staying many, many years in foster care. Do you guys have ideas on how to break this problem down? Yeah, I think it's real simple. When there's a poverty issue, cut a check. Like, if the problem is you don't have enough money, like, let's give people money to keep the family together. And then we begin the journey of let's figure out if there's an opportunity for uh, trainings and skilling and new jobs. And there's a lot that's, you know, we have a cafeteria food worker shortage right now, truck shortage right now. We have infrastructure bill that I believe is going to hopefully create um, jobs for many people, right? And hopefully part of the Build Back Better plan will have some retraining. But I think the fact is, is that somehow we made it okay in America to take 
a person's child away because of a poverty issue when we're spending that money anyway. And sometimes in some cases, even two to three times more than we would have just spent if we would have just gave the family money and said, let's get on a journey together. Well put, six. So anyone else want to hop in? Or I do want to ground into um, some questions we have about um, disabled children in foster care and their placement rates and really the distinct challenge of um, children with disabilities. Ooh, I, have some, I have some thoughts there, which is, again, when you kind of dive in, there was a particular state, I won't, I won't name them, but you know, they were working with a really old IT system, which almost every state has in child welfare. And the only option for tagging that a child had a disability of any kind was you could pick medically fragile. That was your choice. So if you had asthma, medically fragile, diabetes, medically fragile. In the ICU with the trach, like in the hospital permanently, medically fragile. And then they asked potential foster parents, like, will you take a medically fragile child? And most people say no to that because it sounds like you know a full-time job. When you start breaking that down into, would you take a child with asthma? Uh, then people are like, oh, absolutely, teach me how to use an inhaler and it's no problem. And so part of that, I think in most states to this day, children with disabilities of any kind are really at a disadvantage because they're put in, in too large of a group. Um, I'm really excited about things like Washington's recruitment, targeted recruitment team and Cody's work to say like, hey, there's a kid with type one diabetes. Maybe there's a group of people that would not be foster parents under other circumstances, but they have a kid or two or they themselves have type one diabetes and would be like, oh, I can absolutely handle and rock that situation. And you can start doing targeted recruitment there or for children with truly extensive medical needs, um, doing more targeted recruitment around retired nurses or nurses that have flex schedules or different situations like that. Instead of just saying like, you know, I'm not against billboards and radio ads, but doing general foster care and recruitment, I don't know that that helps really serve the kids that, that most need um, a particular kind of home. And then also resourcing kinship providers, because maybe that child with medical needs could be with grandma if grandma had some additional wraparound services. And shockingly, there are some states that don't authorize kinship providers to get any additional services. So if that child needs an aid or something like that, definitionally, you will remove them from, from grandma and place them with strangers because that stranger is able to get that kind of wraparound care. And those states, um, I know some of them are working on it now, but like that's a real nut to crack. So I'm going to um, ask each of the panelists we're coming to close here to give us kind of a, a parting shots. Um, but I'm going to preface it so that we get one. There's one questioner who says, like, is the child welfare system really picking up from failures of other public policy? Um, whether it's housing, mental health, health care. I think, um, Sixto, you got to this in your kind of pointed remarks about poverty. Uh, the child welfare system is picking up very clearly for our inability to tackle poverty. Um, so maybe uh, just going down the line, Marina, Amber, to Sixto, um, one, either, you know, something from your work, something you'd like to close with, um, one wish you have, uh, something you wish the audience knew about your, uh, what you're doing. Just a minute each. Um, I think what I wish people knew is that like this ends up being a tractable problem. It feels overwhelming and there are yet there are lots and lots of not just low hanging fruit, but as we say, like rotting fruit on the ground. Um, and I uh, would love it if, if folks checked out our website at childwelfareplaybook.com. And uh, in the coming months, we're going to have a bunch of new, as I mentioned, like state-by-state -state dashboards where you might be able to see for your state, maybe your state still requires a fax machine for a particular form. You might be able to help fix that. And so I really think like the more everybody can find a role to help uh, the better. So thanks for coming today. Um, I'll just add that I think that feeling is of overwhelm is real and it's okay. And, the, and I feel it too. And what helps me is stuff like this today. It's talking to people, hearing different stories. Marina, your working group, the inspiration that I get from this is just, it fuels me and it takes that fire. So keep it burning. Thank you. You know, one of the things I'll say is that, you know, I make a conscious choice to be in child welfare every day. And people are like, well, if you're trying to solve the issue, wouldn't you want to solve all of these other issues that bring people into child welfare, the poverty issue, the domestic violence issue, right? The policing of families issue. But what I have to say, because child welfare is a petri of America's problems on steroids, right? That so finding solutions here 
actually proves it in the toughest kind of environment. And then you're able to expand those back out. Um, when you look at the Build Back Better plan, one of the things I was excited about is that there's like $60 million for youth subsidized jobs, right? But then another 12 million, and I wish these prices were higher, but they are what they are, um, 12 million for wraparound service. The concept of providing intense wraparound for you, for a young person to be able to participate in the workforce as a teenager, that came from things that we were doing in child welfare and being able to show those examples. So there are many things that you can do in child welfare to plant the seeds for what should be done in America. So Amber, Marina, I'm so grateful to be in conversation with you. If you guys are interested in um, what this problem solving looks like, we'll make sure we share um, out some of the links that they've been coming to you. We can maybe pop them back to every email. If you want to, if you want to go in deep and see what one state is doing, empower the public. We um, tell the story of this kind of detailed wonky reform inside Rhode Island and how sometimes it's not an IT system, it's a staple <laughs> that you need to get people licensed. <laughs> Innovation takes um, a su sometimes surprising form. So really grateful to be here with all of you hosting at New America. And if you are in some other sector and you hear this kind of sharing across states or this centering in the human center design, these are tactics for solving problems that go beyond the child welfare system. So I hope you'll get in touch with this amazing set of panelists. And thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you, audience. It's been a great.